<laughs> Perfect. Shall okay. we begin? Let's begin. Welcome, everyone, to this uh, hybrid session. Thanks, Shani, for bringing us all together. So do you want me to, to say a few words, SJ? Yes, please. OK. Hi, everyone. Um, very sorry that I couldn't be with you all uh, physically. But um, I'm really excited about this workshop. This is a chance for us as a community to kind of come together again around Gen AI and see how we can actually practically use these tools in various workflows that we have, um, doing our knowledge curation on various Wikimedia projects. Um, this is about saving volunteer times and just making our work more efficient. And we've arrange for this workshop to be a bit like speed dating, I, I think. We're going to have um, four different sections uh, of each of us is going to, um, I'm joined by, uh, as you can probably see in the room, by Andrew and SJ and Ilario. Um, and each of us is going to give some section. We're going to have two sections connected to Wikipedia, one related to comments and one related to Wikidata. And this is about really picking your imagination and hopefully inspiring you to play around with these tools and, and see what you can do to to improve your workflows and save really important volunteer time. So I hope you'll enjoy it. Uh, we're obviously not going to cover everything and we have the constraints of the room. Um, there are, I understand that there are three tables, but it's maybe not enough. So um, we're hoping that we can engage you in some capacity. And if not, you can join us also online and try these tools by yourselves. SJ? Thanks, honey. Some of these tools you can experiment, play with reasonably well on your phones if you only have a mobile device. But we're going to show you the workflows assuming that you have a little more screen real estate. And here are some channels where you can already engage. We have a Telegram group that's reasonably active, and a Facebook group where people are talking about Wikimedia and AI. So we're starting with Wikipedia. How many people here have edited Wikipedia this week? It's a good turnout. Uh, and as we'll see, a lot, of, a, a lot of tools that you'll find online are just built on top of a general purpose model. So many large companies and some open communities all have their own general purpose models. These models are excellent at a lot of things, even where they have some hallucinations or mistakes in a few use cases. And uh, one, of the, one of the best ways to get a feel for it is to take something that you know you have to do anyway and to just communicate about what you're doing in the side channel with one of these tools and see what kind of responses you get. And the responses are going to be pattern matching against the kinds of interactions that other people who do that work might engage in. And sometimes you'll discover a modality that you wouldn't have thought of. You don't have to know a question that you can answer. You can, just, you can even just be taking notes about what you're doing as you go through a workflow, and you might find some steps that you can automate. The first four here are closed and proprietary models. Uh, Llama from Meta and Facebook is an open source model that's available for people to run on their own systems. Even though all of the weights are not, are not themselves open, it's definitely accelerated people's ability to build all kinds of new tools without having to worry about um, licensing and approval. And Hugging Face is um, a community that you might find very familiar. It is a commons-like community for everything related to AI all kinds of tools, scripts, platforms, data sets. Uh, it is very community run. And you'll see, if you search for things like Wikipedia data sets, you'll find there are some data sets that, are, uh, that have been contributed by the Wikimedia Foundation themselves. So a lot of organizations and people who you might know have their own accounts, and you can see what, what kind of AI projects they're working on through Hugging Face. Uh, we will come back to that in a minute, because one use for Hugging Face is if you have a project and you're not sure where to host it so that other people can play around with it, it is pretty easy to set up a demo instance that someone can visit and instantiate. So I am going to talk about a few modalities that I find very useful. Summarization, proofreading, translation, style transfer, uh, and drafting both edits and articles. 
for summarization and, and proofreading, the general models are just generally good at this. So here's ChatGPT, um, one of the recent models in the family. It keeps track of sessions that you've opened. So here is a session where I'm translating a novel by a friend of mine who wrote in Arabic into English. My Arabic is not particularly good, but it is good enough to do some proofreading um, to make sure the originals are at least typed properly. And asking for feedback as a translator gets some you know, modest English that I can then copy edit into something that is more reasonable. And this is not a model that's tuned for translation or anything. It's just a very general purpose model. For, for copy editing, I was working on this article um, about, about a particular I, I was working on an article that had a, it had a, a notice that there was some copy editing needed. I was in a hurry. It was a section that didn't have any wiki markup. So I just asked for some copy editing help, and the result is perfectly fine. I was not, I was not trying to do excellent copy editing. I just wanted to clean up that extra part of, of uh, the article I was working on. For, even for style transfer, if you're working on texts that are written for too advanced an audience, or you're working on texts that don't include enough technical language, you can similarly add a, a prompt that invites writing it for a different audience, or gives a little more context about what kind of communication or uh, teaching you're aiming for, and get very good style transfers of, of the text as it exists. For drafting edits and drafting articles, these are things that I find the most interesting, and that are more delicate, and so general models don't always work the way you'd expect. Uh, there is a beautiful new extension called Adifact. I don't know if any of you have tried the citation needed tool that was out a few months ago. This is a new, uh, an updated version of that tool. Uh, I will include a link to the, the plugin on the, on the slides, but if you go to, let's say, um, um, some local Katowice news, and I think this is going to run only on English. I'm sorry about that. Let's try, um, let's see if we can get English language news for a minute. If you're browsing a page and you want to see whether something that you're reading would be reasonable to fit into an article, um, and you use this, this is, this is one entire uh, tool chain. It's, it's one small plugin that runs a number of different queries against the same model. So first it checks to see which articles in the encyclopedia seem the most relevant. It finds two. Then it checks to see whether the claim implied in the text you highlighted is already mentioned in the article. And it, it allows you to click one of them and say, oh, this seems relevant. And it was not directly stated, so Let's try to add a talk page comment. Right now, it will just add a talk page section. But this is the kind of, of tool that, that you know, a script writer could write in a couple of weeks. Uh, if you're used to doing it, uh, if you've done some of them before, it could be much faster. The last thing that I'll, uh, you might enjoy playing with, this is easier to play with, is called Storm. And it is a Stanford project to generate entire articles. And let's say you wanted, uh, give me a topic. A topic to, to write an overview about. OK, great. Uh, oh, I see. All right. So Storm tries to generate an entire article with sections and references, and it does it through a sequence of prompts to the same model, mm -hmm. saying break this down into a few steps, and then um, iteratively go through those steps and combine them into something that, that matches a style guide. Uh, I think I can show you one, one output. Well, well, the one that you asked for was rendering. I asked about thanks for not smoking. Here it produced a whole table of contents. Uh, with some goals and objectives about if you want to thank someone for not smoking, people who were involved with campaigns with that title. It's a very long article. It, it would not at all be appropriate on a Wikipedia. But a lot of the, a lot of the text is interesting, and all of these references um, have been checked for relevance to the text. 
So I think at this at this stage of of the tool, it's interesting and useful for um, for having small like for updating sections or finding paragraphs and references you didn't know about that might be relevant. I think it looks through the hundred best matching search results from a search API, and then it uh, crawls each of the resulting articles and uh, evaluates them with the same model. But the one thing I like about it is you can ask to see the brainstorming process because it feels a little bit awkward to be writing something that you don't know where it comes from. And if you ask, it will show you that first it asked the, the same general model to act as a basic fact writer and look at the goals and objectives of the campaign. It asks it a few questions. You'll see sometimes the, the model says, I don't have enough information. It asks it to act as a public health advocate, as a medical professional, as a tobacco control expert. So it has basically a two-stage process where a non-AI script says, um, Actually, an AI script categorizes the article and says, given the category, what kinds of roles do you think would be appropriate to ask for more feedback? It then asks the same model to adopt those roles and give, give focused feedback in those contexts, and then it pieces it together into the outline. OK, those are the examples. Questions? I want to follow up to your presentation, but it's not available. You, you shared your, your slides. Ah. You uploaded the slides, but not shared with everybody. Thank you so much, Hilario. Il can you upload them? You can fix it. Great. Okay, okay. And I think we can also include a link to the slide deck in the description. Okay. Done. There you go. Uh, that's the end of this. Those are the tools that I wanted you to see and get to play with. Um, Shani. Do we want people to try experimenting after each session or after all of the tools? Whatever you feel like. Um, maybe they can. Maybe they should try what you've been just showing. Great. Uh, so I invite you to uh, make your way to Storm. That's storm.genie.stanford.edu. And here is the history of Katowice. Designed for a potential meeting with the mayor. I can put it in the ether pad too. Put it in the ether pad. And if anyone is trying this and has questions about the process or is not able to find it online, let me know. It's an ether pad too. All right, cool. SG, maybe you can say something about the feedback below, which is pretty unique. Most models don't allow users to like give feedback or give. Yeah, absolutely. Since this is a, a research project by Wikipedia enthusiasts, they're very keen on both working with community members and getting feedback from their users. So at the end of every generated article, they ask you for a quick three minute round of feedback, not just did you like this, but also what are the aspects you think was good? Did you like the fact that they use this hierarchical outline? And are there things that you would expect that, that weren't there? And some of this information, I think, might actually help inform our style guides. I could imagine a future where these kinds of tools literally read the style guides. Um, and I worked on a similar project like that to generate articles and color the, the sentences based on how much they seemed like they might conflict with a style guideline. SJ, can you say something about multilingualism? Is this only in English, or does that work in other languages as well? So Storm is an open source project. It is designed right now to work with English Wikipedia. So I think when it does the search for the most, um, when, it's, when it searches the web, and when it searches for relevant Wikipedia articles, it does that search in English. Because it's a general model, it could very easily translate this into another language that would take you know, one line of, of modification of the code, but getting the sources right, so it was actually searching the appropriate languages, um, resources on the web would be a little harder. But ver can very- we may Maybe we can show people how you're using ChatGPT to simply translate this into, I don't know, Spanish, yeah. Arabic, Sure. So 
In this case, I'm, I might just cut and paste it, but I think when I do this, it will not translate the references. We'll find out. So here's ChatGPT, and um, let's translate this into Polish. Okay, and you can see it got all the way down to reference 27. Some of the formatting got a little bit messed up in my copy and paste, uh, and the URLs did not carry over. That's just a function of this particular interface to ChatGPT. There are, you can build things on top of these general models that, that do preserve all of them. And I'll give maybe a tip from my playing around with this tool. Um, when I'm using ChatGPT and I have a big chunk of text, it's usually better at processing smaller amounts. So I would actually translate section by section and making sure that everything looks proper before I move on to the next one. And by default, it does not necessarily continue past a certain number of, of characters. But you can often say, you can often just ask it to continue. Continue generating. You have yeah. the... Button. Yeah, there's also the button for it. Mm -hmm. But even if you just ask it to continue, you can see it goes from cat straight to Ovice. Any questions in the middle? I think this also highlights um, for all the non-English speakers, me being one of them, this is really allowing you some flexibility in and some strengths, because one of the things that you can do is you can write something maybe in, in a language that is your second or third language, and you can throw it into GPT uh, or similar, um, one of the five that we've shown at the beginning, and you can ask it to proofread it or to, um, to improve the text and making it more encyclopedic in tone, and it's all just a prompt. You can ask to summarize, you can ask all sorts of things that can help you with your generation of an article in a language that is your second language, second or third. And be, like, because there's, there's truly multimodal, you can ask it to do a bunch of strange things all at the same time. You can ask to include jokes if you're feeling bored. You can ask it to take on a particular voice. You can give it a format. You can describe a table. You can just sh include the first few rows of a table and say, please finish populating the table with the details from the text. All of those things could be interleaved in the, in the prompt. And um, if the first pass is not what you were expecting, you can follow up with a little bit of context to say, please correct this part. Yeah. I still mean ChatGPT. And, and can I just add that Chat, this is uh, ChatGPT for O, for Omni. Yeah, this I is like this, the yeah, latest model. Yeah. There uh, are other models, it, but uh, for O is quite good. And if you use it on your mobile phones, you mm. can actually speak to it. So again, if you're a non-English native, um, you can, it's sometimes easier to, to say something, to explain what you want in just plain language, natural language, and then it, it will generate the text and um, write what you're saying in any case and save the history. So this is also a pretty cool feature that can help you do stuff while you are on the go. Mm. I'm I'm doing a translation in the moment for for the DRD German exchange, uh, and and actually I'm using it a lot. But but different voices you need a, an extra feature. Um, no, it it does not give you directly different voices. Um, you have to integrate something uh, different. Then uh, I tried to convince it. To, to do, and then it, it said you have to do this and this and several steps, and then you have different voices. You have voices, of course, but but uh, I wanted to a female and a male voice, mm. um, and that was not easily done. So I continued with the translation, um, and I, of course it can read it to me. But for this you need uh, another feature. Sorry. Thank you. <laughs> yes. And on the on the app on the phone, you can actually pretty easily choose in the preferences which voice you want to read, if it's a female or male, and it has a few options. Um, 
again for the mobile app but um for for the computer i'm not sure i haven't hmm. tried this for by the way can can someone ask the hosts in the room to enhance the mic so that online users and listeners can actually hear you in the room better because you you sound very very far away thanks me and the and the audience members i i'm working on it now i'm closer other questions yes yeah uh do you think that gpt is better translator than deep l which is specifically designed for translation um certainly not better in all contexts i think most of the specialist train models uh, are good at publishing benchmarks against which they are measuring themselves, and they tend to do well on benchmarks. The where you might where you might run into uh, complexities is if you're used to a, a full workflow where only part of the workflow is the translation step, and you are expecting that all of the other aspects will just work smoothly. Like sometimes in the translation, you want it to render things in line. You want it to also know how to render an info box in the middle of the translation. Some of those things might not be as good. Uh, but when you, if you have identified a repeatable task that you want to do thousands of times, it's certainly worth looking at the specialized models. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Shani, I think we can move on to your examples. Sounds good. So I'll try to share my screen if you... Yeah. Possible. I cannot start screen share while others. Let's see. Okay, let's see again. Okay. Um, let me see if that works. If necessary, I can drop and come back. No, that's OK. It should be fine. The other thing I'll mention, is I, I noted that you can set Hugging Face up to host something for you. The Stanford Storm model was down for a weekend, and so I was able to get the same thing running on Hugging Face uh, with basically $100 of free credit in 20 minutes. It, would, it did not take a long time. We can see you. You can see my screen? Yes. Perfect. So I'll just start quickly with this slide, just to say that um, the focus of what I wanted to show today, um, because I'm a researcher and I do a lot of academic work, there are many tools that are designated or dedicated to academic liter literature review and finding references like actual academic publications that are peer reviewed. And I've, at least from my experience, the academic work like academic writing is very similar sometimes to encyclopedic writing. The type of things that we do when we write an article are um, for, for academia are literally the same. We still want references, we want high quality references, etc. So finding the right references is important. And I just, in today's, um, in my section, I just wanted to show you a few of the tools that I've been using as a researcher and also now I'm just using them for everything that I do also on Wikipedia. Um, so obviously I'm not going to show all of these, uh, but um, I did put links to the different, to some of the tools. It's such a big ecosystem. There are so many tools. Um, I, I'm going to try to cover three today. We'll see if we have time, like really just trying to touch base and, and show you a few options and show you what I'm, what I'm using to find references and find uh, and sometimes even generate some texts like uh, SJ showed in Storm. And the first one that I want to show you is Research Rabbit. And Research Rabbit is basically this is what you see when you when you log into it. You it's a free platform, but you need to sign up. So you can use your Google account or you can create your own account for it. And when you enter Research Rabbit, it can be a bit daunting at the beginning. But these are the three buttons that I want you to pay attention to. It's new collections, new category, and there's also a possibility if you are a researcher and you're working and you have like lots and lots and lots of references and you're working with Zotero or Mendeley, this is allowing you to connect to Zotero, which is also open, and you can then therefore manage all the references that you're working with if you're 
doing systematic work on specific topics that may be helpful. So what I'm usually doing is I, I may start a new collection if I'm researching a new topic. And I can show you just an example of things that I did here. Um, I was writing a paper on critical, on, on data-driven decision-making, and um, what it asks you to do, first of all, is to put in two papers. That's all you need. I, I actually put four, but it, um, you can um, add at least two papers, two PDFs, or you can give it a DOI number, and then um, some magic happens that I want you to see. So first of all, it can show you similar work that is happening. And this is one of the cool things. Um, when I saw it first to me, it reminded immediately of Scolia. Um, and I said, yes, this is like a cool thing that we can also, um, we definitely need something like that. And what I especially like about it is the timeline option, because this is a really allowing me to see when um, a topic was, um, when the research around the specific topic started, who are like the main people who have been working on it. And this is showing me the relationships between different types of academic references. So this is one of the key people of the people that I uh, actually added. The green ones are the ones that I added here. And I can see who's like, this is active, right? Like in Scolia, uh, if you know Scolia, but this is allowing me to see the connections between different papers, like who's quoting who, and just give me an overview of the field. And I can ask it to, to see, I, I can ask to see uh, not only similar work, but I can ask um, earlier work, later work, and I can check authors and I can see suggested authors. And for each of these, um, I can actually, um, I can actually click on it and I will see, first of all, an active link that can show me the, the paper, this shows me the abstract, so I can actually go to the paper if I need to, and uh, there's an option to to export it. So this is quite powerful. It just allows me to see an overview of the literature in a specific field, and all I needed is two two PDFs that I have. And usually I'm taking this because I'm doing, I might do a Scolia search, or I might do um, a... Google Scholar search and and find something that is interesting to me, or I was, um, I don't know, I've, I found some article that is interesting to me and I'll throw it in and see what else pops up because I want to get a better understanding of the topic. So this is helping me explore a topic very, very generally, um, just see the literature and go from there. Um, and the, the, the key feature that I love is, is the timeline because it really gives me an overview. Um, so this is Research Rabbit. It has all sorts of other options here, but um, I'm going to move to the next one because um, uh, we have a really short time today. And I also want to show you Perplexity. And Perplexity is, uh, again, one of these spaces where you can ask anything and it will help you um, generate, first of all, find, again, articles and generate some, some texts. And maybe I can have someone in the room give me a topic that is interesting to you that you've been working on and we can see what what it finds in that topic what types of articles come pop up do we have any suggestions from the room english as lingua franca english as lingua franca let's see what it generates so you can see that one of the sources is english wikipedia which is nice, uh, but there are a few others and it can give me, it will give me something mm. and a few, a few characteristics, history, some implications on research. And I really like this bit because it gives me related questions. It can start to think of what else may be interesting in that space. And I can ask follow up questions. I can use the pro option to have like, more nuanced discussions and uh, fine-tune what I'm what I'm doing, and I don't know if you noticed, but there are links here to actual um, academic papers, to uh, different resources that I can click on. Here it's quoting uh, the English Wikipedia article, but I can find some other stuff. 
uh, let's take a look at this one. It will open ResearchGate, and this is the actual um, article, and I can scroll and see and check. And again, a great way to start a conversation on a topic, just exploring very briefly what's happening. And the third um, platform that I want to show you is SciSpace. And SciSpace also is a very, it has a, a variety of options. You can use different things here. You can chat with PDFs. Like if you have a, an article and you want to summarize it or you want to understand, um, to ask questions about it because you didn't have time to read the whole thing, you can do that. You can use it for lit review. You can use it to generate stuff, um, to find concept and, and to rephrase things and um, to help uh, generate citations, which you may not need, but sometimes it's helpful. And uh, again, it's it's very easy. You just give it a topic and it will generate something. Here I asked uh, about digital curation and critical ignoring, which is um, a, a paper that I'm working on now. Um, and let's see what it's doing. So it is... It will give me insights from five papers and I can choose if I want top, um, if I want to, to do more papers. It's, um, I didn't mention, but most of these platforms have either a free option that give you limited things. And then if you want more, you can pay for it. And some of it are like research habit is free. Uh, so it really depends on your needs, but sometimes for our wiki work, it would be enough to use the free versions. And it will generate whatever something for me and give me some academic references. It will show me, <clears throat> which is something that I like, it will show me um, if it's open access, it will show me who else is using, and I can choose actually, I can choose here what I want to see. Uh, it will have insights, it will, I can uh, use different filters to, to sort what I'm doing and I can decide here, sorry, the Zoom is blocking it, but I can decide what to show me, what I want to see, if I want a summary, if I want the methodology, if I want uh, limitations, whatever I want, I can ask it and it will add a column to this table and I can sort it by relevance, by year, by um, newer first, older first, et cetera, et cetera. So this is again, a great way to just explore topics and find references and make sure that you are um, getting to know the topic that you want to write about and finding good references for it. Now, um, I have some, some insights that I want to share before we, we move on. And I would say that the first thing um, is that these tools are a great starting point, but by, by no means does that mean that you can copy-paste, just like we don't copy-paste from any other source into Wikipedia. You need to trust your weak instincts to use your critical thinking in the process, but it is improving the workflows. It's um, shortening the time dramatically for some things. Um, and I will also add that I'm usually never using just one tool. To me, the best results came when I'm cross-referencing from different tools and then I can get a good picture. Um, to date, there is no one um, I think that's the direction they're trying to to move towards. But um, at this point, it's a, there is a multitude of tools, multi multitude of platforms, and it's actually very very hard to follow. So um, to all the can I can I have a I can't see you, but can I have a show of hands um, in the room and you can tell me uh, S J, how many people have been experimenting with? ChatGPT or related tools so far in the context of their wiki work or almost, otherwise? Almost everyone. Almost everyone? Yeah. So you should know um, that this is, and maybe I'm saying it for the people who are watching online or will watch it later, but this can be quite overwhelming. This whole realm of generative AI, there are just so many tools, it moves so fast. Every time that I get used to a platform or a tool, boom, there is a new feature, there's a new model, there's a new thing that I need to pay attention to. So I just wanted to flag that 
Um, I don't know, I think I told you that I'm also researching this topic for the past year and a half. And I, one of the things that I'm doing is I'm running a community um, of like a learning community um, that is mostly active on WhatsApp uh, for Israeli researchers and educators from all across Israel and some people from the industry. Like I'm talking about thousands of, of people on WhatsApp just discussing generative AI and I've been researching it. And one of the things that I found out through the research is that many people find it like literally overwhelming. It's very hard to follow. And this is the strength of being connected to communities of, of learning like ours. I think of our community as, as such. And that's why we shared at the beginning the Telegram group, the WhatsApp, the, the Facebook group, because these are spaces where you can continue to discuss and learn about new things and new features. Um, so you are just know that you're not alone in feeling that it's a lot to take in, but I do think it's worth the effort. Um, there is a learning curve in working with these tools, so don't, don't be embarrassed if it takes you some time to find your new prompt. If you don't get the results that you want at the first go, then find you in your prompt um, and just experiment and share and try to enjoy the process because I think Gen AI is really here to stay. To finish off, I wanna show you another tool. This is a paid tool, but I'm using it all the time because what it's doing is it's helping um, really generate content, but also sometimes um, in my academic writing, you know, you, you read a lot of articles and you know that you've read something somewhere and you're looking for a reference to it. So Jenny AI is, it's a different Jenny than Jenny that does the storm. That's um, uh, as Jay showed, it's a bit confusing. There are two Jennies with J and with a G. Um, so this Jenny is uh, really helping generate text and I can write something myself and I can tell it, bring me a reference to it. Like, find me a good academic article that actually tells me that. And I find it really useful for wiki work and for academic work as well, because it's one of the things is just adding a reference. And um, yeah, so I'll pause here because there are, again, many, many tools, many options. And we'll see if you have any questions that I can answer or if you want to do an experiment together. SJ, I'm counting on you because I can't see the audience at all. Yes, we're looking in the room. Any questions? And I also can't hear you. Question? Uh, excuse me. Uh, will uh, those slides uh, be available? Wait. <laughs> Mic Microphone. OK. Uh, um, I didn't quickly find the um, slides uh, you're uh, presenting. Are there in the, are they in the uh, event TA page? Event we will yeah. make sure to upload them to the. Okay. We yeah. will make sure to upload them. We're sorry it's not there. It Thank was you. Just, uh, I just it. uploaded. Uh, I cancelled mine. I uploaded a new one. Exactly. Oh, awesome! Okay. Thank you, Ilario. Yeah. In the in the page of the, in the page of the, the this event. Okay. Yes. Pictures. And yeah. Ah, okay. I couldn't because hear I, that. Um, because I, I generated PDF. I don't know if I can share the link. What do you think, Shani? Um, I can, I can do that, Ilario. Okay. You can move I, on to you, I and I'll share the slides. I if I can share the link, if it's link. a private okay. cloud or not. Sorry. I, I will do it. It's good, uh, absolutely, because I, I generated, didn't check, and uh, okay. Some other questions? No. Okay. No questions. That's okay. That's okay. I will stop sharing and you can go ahead and I'll make sure to upload the link to the slides. Okay. Second. Is this? Uh... Hmm. I don't know if I want to zoom a bit, but honestly, 
zoom. Let's see, eh? Okay. Better. Okay. But it's too big. Okay. So, second, because this. Uh, Okay, this is my part. I will present a uh, generation of images, how to use uh, some tools to generate images. I want to go more in detail about the question of uh, Shani. A lot of you use uh, ChatGPT, but how many of you use uh, uh, the paid version, so ChatGPT for O? Uh, exactly. Now people decrease a lot. Exactly. Uh, ChatGPT 4 honestly has a lot, a lot, a lot of functionalities. It's very powerful compared to the free version. I looked around free tools and I'm not satisfied at all for generation of images. And unfortunately, I will present you paid tools. Some of this tool uh, works uh, with the system of credits. So you have some free credits that honestly disappeared immediately after some trials, but at least uh, you can try. The single uh, free version I found is Crayon after Night Cafe that is uh, quite free. You, uh, you can receive a lot of credits. Adobe Firefly. Uh, this is a commercial product, but is open, gives you a small amount of credits, and ChatGPT for O because the free version doesn't generate images. Yes? Exactly. Every time it's nice because also Shani told me yesterday, why not Leonardo? Uh, there are a lot of others. Mm, I experimented this tool. And honestly, I use a lot the last two, Adobe Firefly and ChatGPT 4.0. Uh, I didn't want to present everything, but if you have other tools, I'm very happy to know and uh, to have your experience. Basically, I like a lot if you transfer me knowledge instead that <laughs> I transfer you. I can only share my experience. That's, that's all. I don't want to be teacher here. My experience, real, uh, my story about it. Um, okay, uh, what is really important, this was honestly my topic, uh, what happens with copyright for these images? This is a huge, huge problem. <clears throat> I found in Commons uh, this page uh, that gives some answer. All, all, uh, however, you put this uh, template PD algorithm uh, and it looks uh, to work. I suggest to when you generate images to don't use, to don't start from uh, copyrighted version. For instance, don't start from Mona Lisa and uh, say, okay, change Mona Lisa, but something more uh, basic, let's say. Okay, my experience with Crayon is that, um, you see, this is my input, create an image of Wikipedians meeting together, relevance of Wikipedia logo, very short sentence. This gives the possibility to select some styles, and this is the result. <laughs> Very simple. The engine behind the Crayon is Dell E, that is the, the first version of uh, um, the, let's say, this uh, graphic engine of ChatGPT. But the result is not good. I tried also to change a bit the word, but nothing uh, special. Night Cafe. I gave more or less the same, only digital art I added to say, okay, we don't want a picture, something similar to picture, photo, but more uh, artistic. And this is the result. As a good functionalities, because help us after to refine, uh, mm, probably after we can also try a bit to, let's say, to, to experiment. Uh, give suggestion, for instance, after generation gives some tag that you can use to improve the quality. 
Adobe Firefly is very good for some kind of uh, styles, for instance, digital art, and this is the result of Adobe Firefly. But uh, honestly, very interesting is uh, the result of ChatGPT. Okay, this was the first result. Uh, you can see on one side my chat and the other side the result. Is unfortunately it's too small. I wrote create an image of Wikipedians meeting together. Very short sentence. I already gave a very good result. Also describing, this is very nice. While other tools generate an image, uh, ChatGPT is very interactive. Also describe the image. So it's uh, possible to like speaking. I asked, okay, can you change the setting team, for instance, put them in cafe? And they changed, put in cafe. After I said, okay, uh, stress more Wikipedia logo. If you see the first one has no Wikipedia logo, a group of people, stress Wikipedia logo, so put in relevance Wikipedia logo. But the quality is very good. This is always my, my point. After I said, OK, you know, ChatGPT offer also possibility to create uh, a Stripe. OK, so I, I generated very, very simple storyboard. Create a cartoon uh, with two Wikipedians meeting in the street. They greeting each other. They go together and they join a big meeting with other Wikipedians. This is the result. It's not nice because <laughs> they see, because, OK, Wikipedia, via, okay, uh, but uh, it's important because it's possible to improve. Uh, um, it gives uh, this uh, ChatGPT possibility to select the part of the picture and say change this part of the picture. So very, it's very, uh, honestly, compared to one year, the result is impressive and more and more impressive. After I said, okay, can we create characters about this story? This is the result. And after excited, I started to ask more and more. And I said, OK, crane, create a cartoon concept. I started, <laughs> this, you can read only one part. This is the cartoon concept of uh, what happened. OK? Let's see if uh, we can, uh, I can share with you. For instance, now, just here with Adobe Firefly, I asked the same question. Wikipedians in overcrowded room, this room, listening to presentation about artificial intelligence. Propose me four result. Adobe Firefly gives you also possibility to look, this is the best aspect of Adobe Firefly, to select the style. Okay, let's see. It's not so quick, eh? <laughs> it's not so quick. This is why doing demo with images is not easy. As you see, change the design. But the result is, is good. It's possible to work. Eh? Don't expect, uh, it's my problem, don't expect to have immediately good result. There's a lot to work to improve uh, the text. I share with you. At the opposite, my chat, uh, previous chat. So I only extracted partially what happened with them. No? For instance, you see that uh, this is image after they asked the to not cafe, I see the outside. Oops, generated the outside. Sorry. Oops. Outside. There was a year, look, uh, it can look improved a bit. They said, uh, for instance, I selected the balloon. I said, OK, I say ciao instead of uh, via. Wikilove, uh, still to improve this Wikilove, and so on. But OK, what is impressive, when I said uh, create a concept, you can look the concept behind. This is, can be starting to create a game, OK? Imagine that I say, OK, mm, another aspect of ChatGPT is that uh, ChatGPT 4.0 that has memory. So after three, four days, I can ask something. Le look what happens. Eh? 
Ok. So um, created me the concept, I said, okay, create an image about the seventh panel. So the epilogue, no? Okay. Done. So imagine that I want to change something. So no, no, uh, until to go. <laughs> you want to change something with this tool. For instance, you select, I uh, don't know, this image. Ta -da. I'll start from there. Okay. And... Uh, Edit selection, modify the face with using a frog. Fortunately, this is, uh, sometimes uh, when uh, I, I wait, I edit Wikipedia, so. <laughs> mm. Let's see. The basically, I canceled the, the, the face. didn't change with the frog. Okay. What else to say? Uh, I don't know. If you want to experiment something else, I don't know, Shani, until where to go <laughs> to try something else or not. Uh, I have no no idea. I have no idea because uh, when I, I use this tool after, I'm so fascinated that I continue, I continue, I ask uh, something else. I don't know if we want to try with uh, something uh, interactive with them, so they. Uh, we yes, insert. we can definitely do that, and uh, we can also maybe maybe you can say something about the need for it um, in the in the wiki context. So there have been quite a few discussions on yeah. whether or not to even use. Um, generative AI generated photos um, and maybe it's a good space to say it's mm -hmm. not just photos there are now tools that can create videos and mm -hmm. and all of that but um, so all sorts of all sorts of media files but um, mm -hmm. um, I think it can help we've had some experiments uh, done a lot of work mm -hmm. by Neta Hussein doing images of people and um, Mm -hmm. It's been used on, on Wikipedia articles to illustrate some articles with missing pictures. And maybe you can say something about the, the types of uses. Yeah. Um, um, I want to say that the result of this generative AI is not always what you expect. This is my, my problem. Sometimes I write something and I have a strange result. Sometimes very, very detailed. Um, absolutely, if you want to generate something creative, so not too much detailed, absolutely you can use. Um, the difference of JGBT for O is that you can train. You can also create your own chat, training the chat, so giving some files and saying uh, on this style generate uh, some images. Um, I I don't know until when is possible. So the limit where is possible to upload images of ChatGPT or others like Adobe Firefly. Absolutely, you must declare the origin. But. Uh, um, I'm, I want to say that it's not mature yet. So if you create something, um, let's say, like a Wikipedia adventure, something like that, uh, absolutely can help a lot. An example, I use a lot uh, Adobe Firefly to generate images for slides, to document slides, uh, because the result is very good, uh, honestly. I'm not a graphist, <laughs> I'm not a graphist, but they looked quite uh, professional. And uh, sometimes it was also for uh, generation of uh, graphics, giving some data, generating some graphics, and sometimes the result is good. Another thing, for instance, I don't have here to share uh, uh, some schema. 
okay, I say, okay, generate the schema, giving some, uh, some details. Mm. The problem remains that of the copyright. I've spoken with several people here around to know their opinion, some other associations. Uh, what, what is the problem uh, here of copyright? Uh, and honestly, I didn't have an answer yet. <laughs> so I don't know. Mm. For instance, if I take this image, the uh, log, I can upload. I don't think that uh, is imitation of something uh, real that exists, so I can upload something uh, like that. Ilari, I, I want to highlight something that you said, like in oh. passing, but I think it's really important because mm -hmm. many of us are connected to affiliates in the movement and are doing quite a lot of outreach mm -hmm. work, mm -hmm. and that that can be giving presentations teaching, um, creating resources, sometimes even reports of what we've been mm -hmm. doing. And I think these tools can really help affiliates do the, that type of, of work. So sometimes mm -hmm. the work is not in on Wiki specifically, but it's related to Wiki. And these tools can be used as well to, to help us with presentations, with reports, with mm -hmm. summaries of what we've been doing, with generating mm -hmm. blog posts to, to share our work. Um, usually these are tasks that are that volunteers have been for mm -hmm. years finding very, very time consuming and certainly can help. Um, so thank you so much. And I think we need to move to the last bit, which is Andrew mm -hmm. with Wikidata. Yeah. Okay, good. I'll share my screen. I use it from there, but you don't have a microphone. Uh, yeah, I'll move up there in a second. People want to take a quick stretch break. We've been sitting here for an hour. Thanks, Larry. Feel free to take a stretch break as I get the screen shared here. I want a stretch break too. All right. All right. I'm going to, since it's late in the day, um, I'm just going to share one exact use case, and hopefully you find it interesting. And you can, I'm giving you the training data I've used, and you can try it out and see what kinds of interesting things you can do. There's many different ways you could maybe improve what I've done already. But I have a very simple problem. Um, well, actually, I need to reload this. I have a very simple problem that we are trying to solve in the GLAM space. How might we use AI transformers to help map date descriptions to from freeform text to structured data? Very simple, very simple task. I see Larissa back there. We do this all the time in the museum world. Curator enters the date of an item, which looks kind of messy, right? So it's like 305 BEC to 395 CE, or it might be 1194 to 1188 BC, and then we want those as statements in Wikidata, right? That's the general goal. Now, if it's like that, that's actually not too bad. We can kind of extract the first number, the last number, kind of put it in there. But art history is messy. There are approximations. There's a lot of uncertainty, a lot of ambiguity. And this is not even a sad thing. It's just this is, the, this is what art history is about. So we see things like this instead. The first one's not bad, but then circa 1820, so kind of 1820. Um, then we might cross from BC. Are they going to use CE or AD? Not sure. They could use both. Different departments of a museum have been known to use either one. Early, what, what does early 19th century mean? Probably late 17th century. So you can see that once you start trying to make a computer program say, okay, extract this, it's early, it starts to go spiral out of control and you don't know how to f solve this problem. So for many ingestions of, or uploads for GLAM institutions, they just don't know what to do with the inception or creation dates. And often we need to just leave it blank and just afterwards guess at it and try different ways to do it. So when, uh, when ChatGPT and all these other products started getting popular, I said, well, let's try this and see what can be done. So the challenge is let's take those loose text 
loose lexical dates, and turn them into structured statements. So these are the typical properties in Wikidata we want to fill in or we'll wind up using, right? In general, the 571, the inception property. And then we could use 1326, it's like the latest date. We actually have a property that says the latest this would be is this. And then we also have sourcing circumstances, right? So we got circa, probably, oops, I got deleted there, but presumably, and there's actually a lot of qualifiers there that might map better to a GLAM institution's database, right? But maybe you just kind of revert to circa uh, if you're guessing at it. And then there's date granularity too. Um, so what I'm gonna show you is how we might use quick statements. And how many people here have used quick statements before in Wikidata? Okay, a lot of you know of it. It's not that hard to figure out, but the way that quick statements does, and I guess in general, Wikibase does dates, is you put the granularity as the last digit there, right? So you're talking about the century, the year, and all these different things, right? So just dealing with century versus year, you need to kind of twiddle the last number there, which is not that obvious to a lot of people, right? But if you tell the GPT system to do that, it's not, not hard for them to do it all. So this is what I did. I said, I want you to act as a helper to transform dates in an English language description to a more precise date notation. The input will be a text string that describes the date, and the output will be a notation for Wikidata quick statements. One, do you know how to work with Wikidata quick statements? And the cool thing is, it doesn't really need to know a lot about quick statements. That's what's weird about transformers. You just kind of say input, output, input, output, and you give it like lots of it, and there's some kind of weird auto magic that happens, but it's better if it actually knows about quick statements. But then two, how would I get you to do that by showing you examples? And it's kind of cool that you have, this is kind of the innovation of ChatGPT is like, I know you've got the way to do it in there, but this dialogue helps me get there without needing to know how to program it, right? So this is what it gave back. It says, yes, I can help you with transforming it. Quick statements is, oh, so this is good already. It says it knows what quick statements is. And it says, you can provide example inputs, provide the corresponding outputs, and then I'll try it out. Okay, it's kind of cool. So, um, and it, this is what it spit out. It says, okay, if you give me this, I'm gonna spit out this. If you give me this, I'm gonna spit out this. It's kind of getting the thing, but I really need to give it training data for it to kind of know what I want, right? It says, you can continue to provide examples to generate correct Wikidata quick statements. So what I did is I gave it a CSV, okay? So the date is before the comma, right? So some simple ones, 1967 gives you that. 1942 gives you that. So what's on the right is the quick statements notation, basically adding, at, saying add a P571 statement with this date string on the right-hand side. Does that make sense to folks? Okay, so input, output, input, output, basically the commas there. So then I said, okay, ChatGPT, now comes the harder stuff. When I say 18th century, I want you to put in a P571, but look at the last digit, right? It turns to seven. Does everyone see that? So instead of nine, it turns to seven. You're talking about the century now, not just the year. And then I say, well, you we might say 1950s, so that's a decade. So if you see a 50s or 60s or 20s, change the last digit to an eight, right? That's decade granularity. Now we get to the harder stuff. Fourth quarter, 19th century. Oh my God, what do you do here? Well, you can say it starts in 1875 and the latest is 1900, right? And then you say um, that's what you would do for like a quarter, right? And then let's say circa 1900, I'm gonna give you this. But now I add in qualifiers. Does everyone see this? So if I see circa right there, it gives me 1900, but unlike the year 1900, or it's this one, P1480 is sourcing circumstances, and Q5727902 is circa, right? So that's kind of how we do it in Wikidata, saying it's 1900, but it's circa 1900, right? So this is just the first part of it, but I gave it a lot more, maybe about 20 lines, 25 lines. It's kind of interesting how you don't need to give it tons of training data for it to get the gist of it. So the more special cases you give it, the better it's going to be. So the first runs at this, this is the first run I gave to it, it said, okay, how about probably late 18th century? You've never seen this, I've never given you this training data. Um, this is one of the tests against it. And it came out with the right thing. And I don't read strings like this very well, so I took this and I pasted it into the quick statements interface. So I didn't operate on the live thing, I put it against the sandbox. So I put it in the sandbox and look, it says inception, 
1800, I'm sorry, inception 1750, latest date 1800, um, in, and it says sourcing, sourcing circumstances, probably. Pretty cool. In fact, this one test that I went, oh my God, I've been trying to solve this problem for like years, and we suddenly have something that might get us out of this hole, which is really cool. So that's, that's the base result that I got, and I was very pleased with at least a huge chunk of the cases got really good results. So my challenge to you, not only just today, but I'd love to collaborate on stuff and see what you can do with this, like see how far you can go. Um, can you handle other date conversions? I'll give you some really gnarly ones as well if you want to take a look. Uh, uh, probably, pr approximately, presumably, this one's a tough one, like fashion. So when I was working with the Metropolitan Museum of Art, what do you do with fall slash winter 1982 to 83, right? So, oh, Saran knows what to do, well, yes. I don't know what to do. <laughs> Which school? I mean, didn't have to school cat what country? Exactly, like what, um, North America fall? Like you need more context for that metadata to make sense, right? So there's some that are just intractable in terms, like, okay, all the fashion houses are usually New York, London, Paris, so maybe it's... North American, but you know, right, exactly. So yeah, Siobhan asking like, what fall, what winter? Great question, like such weird things to handle here. And then date formats, right? So right now I'm handling just years, but maybe you want to do it with all the different date formats that are out there. Um, different languages, like May, June, July, handle all the languages in the world for how they do the months, possible. But GPT probably has that baked in already, which is cool. Um, and then one really cool thing I tried by wasn't that successful is now that I've taught you this or you know how to do this, generate Python code that can do this. Eee, interesting, right? Um, it suggested like, oh, Hugging Face is a Transformers library and here me show you, let me show you how to do it in Python Transformers with Hugging Face. That's kind of cool. The code didn't work, but I didn't try very hard to get it to work. But you guys might want to try that. It's pretty cool. So here's some gnarly ones, what I call the oof cases, right? And the tough part is like when you have an object that's got multiple aspects to it, especially sculpture and statues. I think we were talking about this in Glam. Like, why don't we have the sum of all sculptures? And I kind of rolled my eyes like, it's so hard. Doing paintings is easy. Sculptures is so hard because you have different parts of the sculpture that get done at different times, are done by different people. It's so messy, right? So we have things like modeled probably circa 1910, cast 1956. So. Imagine the statement you have to add for that. Um, modeled this time, but possibly cast 17th century. So there's all kinds of interesting things you can do here with trying to take these hard cases there. Um, and then, yeah, and then the content, did I put it here? Yes, all this, the prompts and the training data are in the etherpad. So you can go to ChatGPT 4.0 now and replicate where I left off, which I think is pretty cool, and then see if you can do interesting things with it. Try the code generation for folks who know Python better than I do or know another language. Have it go, okay, you now know what to do. Generate some code for me that I can run independently of using ChatGPT you know, cycles. Um, I think that'd be kind of cool. Uh, see what other dates you could do out there. Try it for your own languages and see if you can customize it there. But I'm happy to take any questions, although we'll give you some time to work on it or I'm happy to talk later on. But any things that spark any ideas or questions? Yes, Mikhail. Yeah. Microphone, please. Yes. Go for it. Uh, does it work also well, for example, if you have like multiple values in the same cell? Like you said with the sculptures, if you say like, it was made between like late Paleolithic and third millennium BC. <laughs> You're talking like multiple layers of the, of yeah. the chat GPT to unpack it know where to put things. Yeah, my head spins when, it, when I hear about <laughs> stuff like that. Yes, Susanna. Oh, yes. Um, even though you said that one can take off w from where you left, what would be your prefer uh, preferred uh, way of uh, doing those? For example, I'm giving an example of uh, sheets, like a, a data set, on a data set, for example, in a, in a table. Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, we've talked about some of this in our Glam Wiki Global Telegram group. So since this is kind of a major Glam undertaking, I, I, mean, I think people in the Glam group would be interested in seeing this. We also have an AI group, I should notice that, right? I think Shani put up resources. We do have a Telegram AI group that's not very high traffic, but really great conversations when people try out things 
We'll put little links in there and have a nice discussion about how it's going. So I would suggest the Wikimedia AI Telegram group, or for this, the Glam Wiki Telegram group. It'd be great to see some experimentation there as well. But if you're doing code um, generation, then you could also- continue the question. I'm sorry? Can, can I continue the question? Yes. And have, you, have you tried creating a designated GPT to, to do these workflows specifically for our purposes? Yeah, I could. I could definitely bundle it up into one you can call, although I don't have tons of API allocation to do it, but I think it would be kind of cool to do that. Absolutely. So, yeah, it's on. Um, so you're doing these experiments, I think, directly in ChatGPT, mm -hmm. but I think the use case is that you have a spreadsheet, you know, with names of, of artworks and columns of creators, and then you have a column with these dates, with, that mess, with those messy dates. So the thing I would really like to do in a lot of, you know, both data cleaning work, but also Wikidata work is actually use the spreadsheet software itself, Google Sheets, oh, fui. Uh, <laughs> or, you know, and then have the AI inside the sheet do it. And, and it's just a question to the room. I've experimented with plugins in Google Sheets. Mm -hmm. You have to pay for them. Um, do people have success with that? Really? Mm -hmm. Have people done that in sp inside spreadsheets? <laughs> Sandra, it's, it's, from what I know, recently they added the option to actually edit directly the, the spreadsheets directly in the in the chat. So when you are uploading a document to ChatGPT, uh, you can actually work on the data inside. You don't you, it doesn't have to even generate it again, again and again and again. But they're getting better at um, and there are specific tools that are not GPT to to kind of do work on Excel spreadsheets and all that. Yeah, I think if the, you can write a Google Sheets app script that just does an API call and get something back. So that's free. So if you can package it in that kind of interface, it could work. So that's a combination of what Shani asked and probably what you asked. If you can package like date conversion as a service, saying I'm gonna send you a string, you give me a quick statement back as an API, that would be really cool because then you just call it like crazy from a spreadsheet or any kind of interface, right? It'd be nice to have like a confidence factor too, but that's not in the purview of these GPT type tools, right? Yeah, because you wouldn't wanna just fly blind and say, I'm gonna trust everything that comes back. You'd like for it to have, give you some kind of confidence factor of what it knows. Like, oh, I know how to do 1940, but I may not know how to do like early fifth dynasty approximately or something like that, right? Or you could provide feedback as well for it to learn from. Right, right. Yes. There's custom GPT bots that you can now create. If you have a chat GPT pro account, they give you access to create your own like custom GPT bots. They're pretty easy and straightforward. It has like 20 allotted files as their knowledge base. And then you can give it like a framing of how you want it to be output. In my work, I created one to be a narrative change strategist and I give it my information, our theory. And the point of the bot is to train organizers on how to use narratives within their work politically, but you could train them to always give you the same outputs and the same format that you want it. Yeah, that's what I was talking about yep. as well. Yeah. That's right. So, so this just, uh, since you folks are interested in the code generation or the how do we make this a service question. So this is an example of what I said to the dialogue after I was like, this is cool, but I don't have enough credits for people to chew up my ChatGPT account. So how can I dump out what we just did into a, let's say, a hugging face transformer uh, system that I can run on my own or cheaper, or let's say, let's deploy it on LiftWing with the Wikimedia Foundation. I don't know how to do that, but maybe some AI out there does. Uh, that'd be cool. So, you know, it started to give me the code to do this, you know, and most people who've ever done code generation out of ChatGPT knows that if you copy paste, there's like a 95, 98% chance it, it don't work, but pretty close. I mean, it's impressively close, but it don't work. So you gotta know Python pretty well to debug it, and that's not the easiest thing to do, right? Uh, any other questions or comments or insights? Otherwise, I'm happy to hand it back to 
SJ or anyone to, for, for feedback or insights. If anyone's been playing with this so far in the room, and I encourage you to, we still have eight or 10 minutes to, for anyone to tell us what they might have tried out or what they might have uh, seen along the way. But uh, I also want to make sure to show this slide because it's not just about ChatGPT. I know it's the easiest, lowest, lowest hanging fruit. They're giving away the product to make you addicted to it. I know, we all know this. The first 100 hits are free with ChatGPT. But as SJ said, we've had really great conversations with Hugging Face um, and we should broaden our horizons to make sure we're engaging a wide swath of AI um, approaches and partners. Yep. SJ? I just have a question for the room, for anyone who has been training your own models or developing some of your own experiments, where do you, where do you post them? Where do you store them? Right now, we have it private just to our organization, but the goal is to eventually deploy it to all these different organizations so they can have it. Um, we're building prompt recipe books, and we're building training models, and we're trying to really get people more comfortable with the idea of using AI. But even within our own team, people are a little bit hesitant to use it. Um, but you can, they have like a custom ChatGPT store that you can go and access those, those bots, but I have it private right now because I don't want to reveal my secret sauce. That's understandable. <laughs> Is anyone working with students or collaborators that are also developing some of their some of these kinds of tools? I think maybe I can share uh, with my experience. I try to extract semantic triples from the text to Wikidata, and unfortunately, there are a lot of mistakes that uh, ChatGPT do. Uh, I mean, it can extract triples uh, and the name objects, but it often make mistakes when you want to map name named entity to uh, Wikidata identifier. Mm. So of course there are some um, researchers on the topic how to improve this how to catch these errors and correct them. But it will be interesting when ChatGPT or other language models can uh, solve it. I think this generative AI, especially large language models, can improve the workflow on Wikipedia and Wikidata, so we, I think, as fast we can learn how to prompt such tools, uh, then it will be better for society because we can improve the quality faster. And this is, you know, language models learn from Wikipedia to improve the quality. We improve the quality, so it's, it's just a comment. Yeah, I, I think the learning definitely proceeds in both directions, which is why I'm curious if anyone is using shared um, shared code libraries or model libraries. Something that uh, we have talked about but haven't done is to have a like a joint community space for publishing models, for instance, on Hugging Face or on alternate platforms. So if people start to. Um to sh we can show how to do some simple model, and maybe society can learn how to create own models and will also share with us. Why not? Maybe some competitions. Uh, recently, we, our department um, uh, participate in um, competition on quality assessment, credibility assessment of information. Mm -hmm. So maybe Wikipedia can also create some um, organize some competition on that. That makes a lot of sense since we do have internal teams building quality assessment models. Uh, I think the foundation staff have worked mostly on language independent quality assessments, but there's also a lot of good work across the research community in, in um, assessments that look at the content. Uh, if we have one, if we have a, a minute, um, Shani, can I share my screen for? Yeah, uh, I just shared mine because oh, I, let's I see it. 
I just wanted to show folks um, Jenny AI and how it really easily shows references to a statement that I've written. So let's say I have a, this is an article about data-driven decision-making that I've been working on. And let's say that I have a really simple sentence that I've written, but I want an academic reference for it. Too. So all I have to do is like mark the sentence and click on this button called cite and it will give me a bunch of articles that are peer reviewed, high quality, and I can choose which one uh, I want and I can explore them, et cetera, and add them to my library. And so this is how easy it is now to find references. So just wanted to show that, like the interface because I, I did it before. I'll stop sharing and you can share. There's a question in the room. Ah. Can you ask? Can you ask Jenny to verify that a citation is because absolutely just present? by uh, adding a citation is not enough. It's just like, mm -hmm. oh, I added a citation, but if the phrase is oh, not I never, present, I never add a citation without checking the article. Oh, okay. But it it like curates. Okay, it I just see. gives me instead of going outside, and start exploring Google Scholar and all of that, and going one by one, it just shows me the brief and it will show you the exact space in the text where it's relevant. So it's, it kind of, again, uh, saves time in the process that I found very useful. Yeah, That's thanks. why I wanted to show it to you. SJ, go ahead. That's great. No, that, that, was, that was everything. Thank you. Thanks everyone for coming.